I'm Collier Landry. And I'm Brenda Fisher. And this is Moving Past Murder. And on today's Moving Past Murder, we are discussing my new obsession, which is TikTok. You have been a longtime TikTok fan and supporter, and you yes. have encouraged my TikTokness. And yes. so, I, to give a very brief history of my TikTok experience, I started a TikTok account like two years ago because it was dating this girl at the time who was trying to be like a social media influencer. So she's like, mm -hmm. you need a TikTok account. And of course my TikTok account was just silly random stuff of me. Like when I'm at, you know, filming on location or something, just like random stuff. And at the time I was working at a studio and we had this great space. So I would just always like post whenever I was shooting. Right. Um, but I never really delved into it until last week when I started putting my TikToks about my personal story on TikTok. Right. And that leads to our conversation today. So what do you think? Should we do it? Let's do it. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in Richland County history. Dr. John Boyle is accused of killing his wife, Maureen, and burying her body in the basement of his new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. I did not kill Maureen. I never harmed her at all. The 12-year-old son of accused murderer, Mansfield Dr. John Boyle, finally took the stand. As I heard a scream, I heard a thud. It was about this loud. Did the jury in this case find the defendant guilty? I confront my incarcerated father in prison. And finally, I'm gonna have that moment where I can ask this man, why dad, why did you do this? Everyone knows it's premeditated. What I wanna know is why. Collier, I have told you the truth. This is a psychopath. He's believing it while he's saying it. Do you think you're a sociopath? No, no, no. Okay, so Brenda, TikTok, which is <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out how you make the video, what you do, blah, blah, blah. But I've heard it's a great way to promote podcasts and things of that nature. So I figure what the heck, and we'll just kind of delve into the waters of the true crime TikTok. Well, you know, you, you, you tell me all the time about your TikTok experience, which is mostly like doggy videos, right? Yep. Anytime I am feeling down in the dumps, I just go on TikTok and just do a nice deep dive into doggy videos and pretty soon I'm cackling out loud and I feel so much better. Well, you, <laughs> you have this thing because every time when you see my little Chihuahua Blondie who has, you know, she's blind and she's, you know, she's almost 17. Um, yes. you do this whole, it's like no petting, no petting. It's yep. no petting, no petting, no petting. And is yep. that, and that's a TikTok thing, right? That's a TikTok, one of the audio pieces that you can put with your doggy videos. And uh, there's another one that's, that's just my baby doggy. And I think you should do that one too. So I should do that's my baby doggy on TikTok? My baby doggy and no bed thing. Well, I yes. also heard there's a thing called No Bones Day, which is like a pug that's really old or something. Uh-huh. Because my friend said, it, oh, is it a No Bones Day? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I have posted a couple of videos of Blondie, but I've also posted parts of the documentary. And one of the one of the really crazy things about reaching out on social media is not only do you get you know interesting characters that come along in your life, like stalkers or obsessed fans or people that are just really really curious about your true crime life, but also right. you know one of my whole reasons for making a murder in Mansfield, then starting the podcast, traveling around the world, speaking about the film, and it was not only to, to really discuss things that are important to me, like the consequences of violence on communities, families, the impact uh, on ancillary victims that aren't just the person that gets killed. It's the, it's the family, it's the friends, it's the, it's the ripple effect that these violent circumstances have on, on people and like I said, in communities and, and society as a whole. But also, there is a whole side of me that I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about my family because, as you know, you know my father is. You know, I'm I'm telling the police about the murder. Nobody believes me except for the one detective. Then mm -hmm. my father gets arrested for it. Finally, then. I'm the one who testified at the grand jury so they could secure an indictment for his, for my mother's murder against my father. And then with that came with the consequences of the fact that 
my mother's side, my father's side of the family abandoned me because of whatever issues they had with me testify, like, you know, essentially getting my father arrested and having that whole sort of betrayal. I think, I think they, they felt or whatever it is. I don't really ever have a, have a, have an answer from them. Mm -hmm. But also that my mother's side of the family not wanting to deal with me as a uh, as uh, a as the son of my father. Right. And and, you know, as as we discussed in one of the other episodes in the podcast, I call it sins of the father, which is I had uh, some relatives reach out to me on my mother's side that wanted to um, you know, wanted to talk to me. And and but then. When they told other relatives, they were like, well, you won't want to be talking to him because you're going to get sucked into him because he's his father's son, which is the sort of cross that I've had to bear most of my life. Right. So right. Um, I don't know a lot about my family. Well, because of this posting on TikTok, I receive a note from somebody who had followed me a couple of weeks prior. And like I said, I wasn't active on TikTok until like a week ago. And this person followed me and they reached out. And they had been married to somebody in my family. And the, the crazy thing is, is that this person who reached out and I don't want to get into too many details because I haven't, it's a new relationship. I don't want to convolute anything because I'm so, I'm so elated that I've actually yeah. got people that are going to be willing to talk to me about my family <laughs> right. uh, because no, I just, amazing yeah there's so much that i don't know there's so many because the the fact of the matter is is i i can't trust anything my father has ever said because he's a right. sociopath and a liar i mm -hmm. you know my mother's not here to ask things and the family is so screwed up on both sides unfortunately that nobody talks to me about anything so my whole life has been putting these little puzzle pieces together, these little nuggets of information that I just grab out of the ether or I'll take from my father's letter and I'll ask someone else. And it in and of itself is like an investigation and, and for me to put these pieces together. So Absolutely. this woman, this woman has reached out and she was married to someone in my family and, you know, had said the general consensus is, is that, she had wanted to reach out for a really long time. She had seen the documentary, then she started to listen to the podcast, had read stuff, had seen my TED talk and, and astounded on the young man that I ended up becoming. Because a lot of, you know, my, my original family, my birth family, they are all from Philadelphia. I grew up most of my life in Ohio. So Philadelphia is a very urban, one of the first cities in the United States. It is a, it's a very historical city and it is very, uh, I don't know if cosmopolitan would be the right word, but it is a city environment, a very urban environment. It is quite different mm -hmm. than growing up in a rural place like Mansfield, Ohio. Yes. Um, and so that was one of the things when, when my parents moved to Ohio is it was, it was a huge thing, a huge adjustment for my mom and my dad because they were used to like a sort of city life at least growing up in that environment and then it's like oh there's cows and corn and... <laughs> so it was a totally different experience um yes there are there were a lot of people who were involved with my family who were relatives who were um you know almost like bystanders while the whole trial was going on and while what happened to me when i was you know in foster care and then i was finally adopted and all these things but the thing that resonated was this person said i don't know anything about your um your adopted parents or that family but i can tell you in my very brief experience you were probably better off <laughs> which is like, whoa, what? You were really lucky. I've heard so many horror stories about the foster care system and you know, the fact that you went to a family that wanted to adopt you and you know, ultimately they, they've been there for you, you know? And, you, and it's so great when you talk about them and like over Christmas when you went home, you know, to see them and sure. you know, I just, some of the things that you say and do you can just tell that there is a very deep bond there. And, you know, not everybody can say that. 
And so I think that's great. So kudos to your parents. I think that's amazing. Yes, absolutely. And it, and it is. It, and they were amazing. And, uh, and I was very, I was very fortunate because there yes. are a lot of kids that go into the foster care system that don't have that sort of happy ending or no or i mean i don't know if you call it a happy ending but just even like a normal ending or just like you're in a family and granted there was a lot of you know issues that we had to work through right they didn't no family's perfect no family's perfect i came with a lot of a lot of stuff that that i don't think anyone would have been prepared prepared for i know i wouldn't have been you had a few extra bags on top yeah, of your And just on. the community as a whole. And just, it's sort of like you yeah. took in this like kid, right? That everyone knows that was in that, you know, a lot of times when I'm telling people about it, it's a, I feel, especially like when I came to Hollywood and I worked with people that like grew up in the entertainment industry, right? That were yeah. like child stars that were in films and television shows and they grew up in the public eye. Well, I, in a lot of ways, even though it was a, more of a brief time than being on a television series right. for years. I was, you know, testified at the trial in the courtroom that was on television. I was in all the newspapers. Everyone knew who I was. Everyone knew the story, even if I didn't know them. So right. a lot of that factored into my upbringing. Right. And but anyways, so back to what I was saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this person reached out and I actually spoke to them and got, First of all, what I want to say is the the really amazing thing about being able to connect with people that were around before I was ever even conceived or born and right. that knew like my mother and my father. And this was something that I thought was uh, as I was talking to reaching out to some people who did agree to speak to me prior to making the documentary – And did tell me about my mother. I mean, one of the things that I, you know, and I know that I covered on another episode of the podcast was, is I never realized that my, I knew my mother went to University of Pennsylvania School of Dentistry and became a dental hygienist. What I did not know is that my mother supported my father so he could become a doctor. So she was the breadwinner while he was in medical school, while he was getting his undergrad. She was the one who supported the family because my father never gave her credit for that. And my, of course not, uh, of course not right? Because he's a narcissist and a sociopath. But uh, so when I discovered these things, I was like, wow. And just to talk to this person and to have them echo those things that I knew about, that I was, that I've, that I still am discovering about my mom and my family. And to have those things echoed and to know that this was the type of person that my mother was. And it's almost it, it, her, her statement to me and, and what was really, really cool is that even though it was completely horrific to the family and mm-hmm. without getting too much into it, and I'm hoping that, they, that they're going to be on the podcast because I've already talked to them about that and they, they haven't said no. So we'll see. But one of That'd the be things nice that to have somebody from your family it would be actually. amazing it would be amazing yeah. and, and i've you know uh, uh even with their limited sort of interaction with my parents right but they also you know they, they said that everybody in philadelphia that had found out about this happening and that my father had murdered my mother they were horrified and that i was the one that was essentially was the one who went to the police and made sure that my father, you know, was, was, was held accountable and, and, and in the justice system and, and testified against him and this, that, and the other, but also as horrified as they were, there was this segment of a lot of them that were when the documentary came out and, and they had followed, they, they had then started following my life. I think probably the biggest the coolest thing for me is to find out that they weren't surprised. And when I say that, I mean that they weren't Uh surprised that I was like a guy that had his shit together, despite all the stuff that happens. And then when I, you know, 
when I say the term have my shit together, I mean, <laughs> like I have my, I have my own set of flaws. I am human just like everyone else. But I think that the general consensus is for a lot of people that go through extreme trauma, like myself, a lot of times they fall apart, you know, it's just unfortunate and it, 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 it just happens. And, um, and when it came around, when they were all watching the documentary, or they saw the forensic files and then they saw the Ted talk after the documentary and all these things that I did, they were like, well, yeah. And the, and the reason why they were like, well, yeah, of course he was is because that they, they all said, because that's Noreen's son. <laughs> so it was really amazing yep. to hear that not only that they felt this way, but that they, they sort of, we're like, well, yeah, of course he had it together because Noreen had it together. And this is her son. <laughs> like, of course. Yes. And so I think that when I get these, when I talk to these people, not having known them, but just the things that they have to say about my mother is so amazing to me. To Because I'm still, I don't, you know, my relationship with my mother in the, at least in the physical world ended when I was 11 years old right. and I never got to know her as the person that she was as far as like an adult, like I don't have an adult relationship. And I, and I did have for a child, I had a very mature adultish relationship with my mother because of how she treated me. But I never had that relationship as if I knew her now, I could see the woman that she is or was right. And to have these people come forward with these amazing stories of just of the person that my mother was, and not only that the person that my mother was as a person, but the person that my mother was to them, right. even in their limited engagement with her is, is fucking beautiful, <laughs> is mind blowing to me. And it's, it's definitely been one of the highlights the real highlights of doing this, this type of, uh, of, of thing, <laughs> uh, of putting right. myself out there, of, of putting the documentary out there, of doing the podcast is when these people reach out, they just, they have such fond memories of my mother and such ways in which she graced them. And it's really incredible. So I love that. It is. That's a, that's a powerful thing and a, you know, and such a positive one. And, and I'm glad that that's happening. You know, I'm glad that these people are reaching out and reconnecting or connecting for the first time, so to speak. And, and, it, and it's like, I have the, you know, and, and, and this person has kids my age. And so it's like, I have all these cousins that I don't know of, you know, and it's, yeah, it's really exciting. It's, it's, you know, <laughs> I, I was talking to a friend of mine and, and, and obviously when you are a documentary filmmaker and then you are a uh, independent filmmaker, you don't exactly choose this. Uh, you know, sometimes, yes, you hit the lottery and you and you you have tremendous financial yeah. and creative success. But a lot of times that is the life of an artist is, is a struggle. And but the social dividends and the personal dividends that I've that I've been able to um, accrue, if you will, from doing the doc, doing the podcast, connecting with people is just like, it's just incredible. It's, you know, this and now TikTok. Is, this was a great idea, wasn't it, Collier? It was a great <laughs> idea to join TikTok. Great idea. Yes. TikTok and, and uh, doing the podcast. And, yeah, it's all, it's, it's fantastic. And so thank you, Brenda, for forcing my hand in that way. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm glad we did this. Yeah. But it's it's cool because it's it's like I'm always struggling, you know, I'm always trying to and there is a point to this whole episode. This is just not me going to be blabbering on and on, but I think that there really is a, a real value to someone putting yourself out there in these ways. Yeah. Because for a very long time I held the belief in my heart that I was like, all is lost. I'll never be able to find out these answers to these questions that I want to know. You know, for me, it started very fundamentally at 
the core, which is why did my father murder my mother? It's why I made a murder in Mansfield. It's why I went, it's why I moved to Los Angeles in the first place was to literally be here to learn filmmaking, to tell my story. So my mother didn't wow. die in vain. So I didn't, uh, so all these things would happen. Right. But then it, it evolves into this, you know, and, and you, and you have these goals and you have these things of like, I, I, First step is I want to get to do this. And the second step is I want to do this. But I, but it's really amazing when you start to just see it all unfold in ways that you didn't even imagine it was going to. It's right. like now I'm learning all of these things about my family that I had no clue about. Some of them good, some of them bad. But I, it's like this Definitely puzzle that I've been trying to put together for all these years, piece here, piece there, boop, boop, boop. It's it's all coming together and it's very cool. It is very cool. It's very, very cool. That's my big news that I wanted to share, <laughs> to share. <laughs> Which I know that That's I did earlier like with you, but I didn't share it with the audience because I just, you know, I haven't had the opportunity, but it's, um, so if you're listening to this podcast or you're watching this on our yes. YouTube channel, you know, uh, please reach out if you feel so inclined, but I would love to hear from you. And, and the, the crazy thing was is she left it with this cliffhanger. She said, there's more, there's more people that want to reach out to you. There's more people that want Aww. to talk to you. Like you have these people that are here and everybody, I mean, obviously like they don't know me and they're like, okay, you know, like they know what happened, but they don't, it's a, I, I can't imagine. It's a really hard thing to, yeah to reach out and be like, Hey, I'm really sorry about this. I'm a relative because then there's also this sort of guilt and shame thing. that kind of comes around with it where they feel like, Oh, well, we should have reached out. We could have taken the kid in or whatever that looks like for them. And it's, I don't look at it that way. I'm just happy yeah. to hear from them. I'm just happy to know that they're out there and that something I've done has impacted them. And you know, Anyways. Absolutely. No, and it's, you know, everything turned out the way it was supposed to. So, you know, before, you know, time has gotten away from everybody, this is a great time to reach out and reconnect. And, you know, and I just hope that everybody knows you don't have any hard feelings against anyone. You know, you're just happy to have those connections out there and people who, you know, want to get to know you now. I think that's great. And, you know, it's like we talked about 23 and me and I found out I had a brother that I didn't know about. Exactly. And I, that was amazing. And I didn't care. I didn't care what the situation was. I was just so excited that and I still I have had to do sibling. the 23 and me, 23 and me, because I want to know with my father's womanizing ways, how many yeah. other brothers and sisters I might have in the world. <laughs> Yeah, that was a bad joke. Touch but someone, it's, but with, it's, guess who your dad is? Yeah, I'm sure the Manson kids, when they do their 23 and Me, are like, "Yikes!" <laughs> I'm sure. That's, I mean, it could be it's, worse. It's, it's you know that is definitely a, a a thing too. There are you know children who are who have grown up knowing that their father or mother or, or parent was a someone who took the life of someone else or multiple, right. multiple people. And right. they sort of live under that shadow. And we, of course, you know, this is, you know, I, as I, you know, I spoke to Rebecca Reisner, who's writing the book on forensic files. And we talked to you mm -hmm. last month about uh, America's obsession with true crime. And this is kind of segues into something that I wanted to, to discuss. We were, we were talking about earlier, which is, you know, there's this obsession with, murder and and these crimes and there's a program called what is it my favorite murder yes. which just got signed to a big deal it's undisclosed on amazon and you know i understand that a lot of these programs are very very interesting to people and very very mm -hmm. you know they love hearing about all of this and these murders or serial killers and stuff and i feel like with this program, you know, you're getting my, my experience as someone who's been through it, who's saying, okay, it's okay to talk about this because we have to face these things because we can't let them control us. We have to literally move past murder. 
or whatever right. these circumstances are. At the same time, I feel like there are a lot of these programs that I, I, I wouldn't say they're glorifying. They're not glorifying, but they are very obsessed with murders. And when you say like my favorite murder, guess what guys, I'm going to tell you this. There is no favorite murder when your loved one get is the one that gets murdered. Right. It's not a favorite murder. It's not a favorite thing. It's not a fun thing. It's not a, let's see. It's, it's, it's a legit thing that that shit destroys people's lives. You know, Yes. I am fortunate enough that I landed in a spot starting with my mother and how she raised me where I did not let it destroy my life. But I am definitely have, I definitely have my fucked up isms because of what happened to me. But there are people that have been literally paralyzed by this. So one of the things that I want to get into this program, and I, there are many people that I have on the slate to talk to, to interview, is discussing really delving into our obsession with true crime and why is it so important? Uh, you know, it's one thing if we're looking into cold cases and we're trying to find out who, who is, who it is, who, who could have killed these people? Why is right. this person missing? And we're trying to uncover and get leads and use social media and all these things of the day that are at our fingertips and at our disposal. It's another thing to look at these crimes and almost glorify them. So I, I have this sort of issue with it a lot of times. I mean, look, Brenda, you're a true crime fan. What do you think? I am. And I think that I don't think anybody likes true crime stories because they like seeing people murdered. I don't think anybody watches it for that. I hope not or listens. Um, I am a true crime fan because I like to learn about why things happen and how did it get to that point? Was it a, you know, crazy serial killer? Was it crime of passion? What, you know, what was the situation? And more so, you know, the thought process behind it all. Um, that, you know, is interesting to learn. And the voices, it always seems like the voices that are involved in true crime, like on Forensic Files, that's probably my favorite narrator sure. of all times. Sure. Um, just an incredible voice that just kind of is relaxing. And it's like, I need to listen to forensic files so I can relax. But, but the content they're talking about, you know, is a completely different story. Um, but I think it's educational. I think that women and, you know, and men should watch these things with their kids and not to scare them, but to show them that, you know, the world is kind of a scary place at times and you just need to be very aware aware of your surroundings listen to your parents don't sneak around don't not tell them where you're at because it always seems like that's when things go sideways and then they can't help you um you know the the people that care about you the most that don't want you to be hurt you know teenagers always try to hide things from and that's when you know, that's when a lot of them go missing. So, you know, I just think that yeah, and I, there's so and much look, to learn. And look, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing true crime because I'm not at all. I, I, but what I am saying is, is, and, and you know what, I could be way off base here, you know, because I am looking at this through a particular lens of someone who has been mm -hmm. through these circumstances and despite that being my unique voice, it is a biased voice. I mean, I'll just get real. I'm somebody who has dealt with this. And I am also somebody who continues to deal with this with the people that reach out to me via social media um, that have been through their own challenging circumstances that literally will see the documentary and go, you know, just to put it very bluntly, man, I thought my life was fucked up until I saw yours. <laughs> and which is fine. Like, look, I get it. it my circumstances are completely crazy. And, uh, but, uh, and when I made a murder in Mansfield, it was always my goal to you know, heal myself and impact one another's life. And then there's people that reach out that say, you know, your, your film saved my life. And there's going to be somebody who we're gonna, a young man we're going to speak to on this program in the next couple of weeks that, that, that I reached out and said that exact thing. I, I, my father murdered my mother. I literally was contemplating suicide. I logged on Amazon. I saw your film. It changed my life. And I'm still here three years later. And it's incredible. When you see things like that, it's unbelievable. And 
you know, one of my friends, Alexis Linkletter, hosts uh, The First Degree with Billy Jensen and Jack Van Neck, and they mm -hmm. have another series called Unraveled, which I believe the new episode airs tonight on Dis in Investigation Discovery. You should check it out. It's called The Stalker's Web. Um, but, you know, and, and they tell these stories under the, under the guise of, like, we are trying to show you that also people can come through these circumstances and that they are crazy. And, and you know, specifically with the, mm -hmm. with the stalkers of, like, understanding that that people do this to people and it's a way and it's a way that they bully and control people with stalking and this abusive behavior even if it's online or even if it's from afar uh one of the things that i was discussing with this relative is my father's continual use of his letters to control some of my other relatives that are that live in fear of him and he's not even here and and Obviously, a lot of people in their justification be like, well, why are they afraid of your father? He's in prison. Well, because when you when you are a sociopath or a psychopath, you are still able to manipulate and control your victims, even if you're not even in the same room, same state or, or physically able to have to get on an airplane with the threat that I'll see you in four hours when I land at LAX, you, you know, you, they still hold it and that's a lot of that's true with people who are victims of sexual assault which were you know I, i'm talking to another guest of mine about the power uh, the power differential and why sexual assaults occur occur especially with children and and uh, adults and and the power struggle of that mm -hmm. and, and and it's a power thing power versus sexual it's it's a power thing and look my father was very guilty of that. It destroyed my family before the murder of uh, uh, molesting my two cousins, uh, which he was going to be arrested for a year before he murdered my mother, you know, and and that whole whole thing. So there are a lot of things that fall under that that true crime category that I believe do open up these discussions for sure. Definitely. But I guess, you know, I always say this with the thing of like, you know, let's always understand with a little bit of empathy and understanding for the victims and their families, yes. but also even understanding the sickness that involves some of these crimes and approaching it from a, you know, mental health is a big, very big issue in America right now. And we see this and, you know, I, you look on, you know, on the news and, oh, crazy homeless people everywhere, a crazy person. Oh, there are drugs and this and that. Right. Yeah. But some of these people are on drugs because they can't get the help they need. So they turn to drugs to give them the help that they need. And then they become drug addicts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a system that feeds itself. It's, you know, yes. uh, what is it's uh, circadian, if you will. So and not in a good way. Um, yeah. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> but you know I and I totally get where you're coming from too and it, I think that if everyone that you know that are doing podcasts and that type of thing if they do it from a place of providing information and helping people and not just you know the glorification of these horrible things that happen then that can be a really positive experience and can help people and you know, and I think that if we all, you know, try to take that responsibility on to try to be aware of how we can help other people and that other people are dealing with horrible things every day and just being a voice out here and someone that will listen and that's who you are. You know, you're that guy that will listen, that does care. You know, you're not about, oh, look at me, you know, I want to be famous kind of person. You're just not that person. Um, and so if good people like you can take their negative experiences and help others through hard times because of what you've learned, you know, I think that's an amazing gift that you have to give. I'd like to think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, one of the things that seems to impact a lot of people on the program is when I read like my father's letters, especially mm -hmm. I was engaging with somebody on Instagram earlier today about, you know, 
They would listen to one of the episodes when I'm reading the letters, which I got to delve in. I got this whole box. There's like 500 of them here. We got to really delve into that. A lot of times it just turns into this like religious jargon that just is, you know, nauseating right. at times. But one of the things that, that we, um, you know, uh, that people have really gained a lot of insight from is when they, when I do read those letters and they go, God, that sounds like my ex-husband or my ex-wife mm -hmm or my father or my uncle or my aunt or my mother, they, you know, and especially again, like when I talk to people is like, you know, we were in lockdown for like a year and change with people that we got to know really intimately Yes. <laughs> that you think, you know, somebody, but you have this reprieve and you, you know, where you can go off to work or you can go see your friends and associates, go to the gym and get your workout in. Both sides too, the the abuser and the abusive person, because then they get to take their aggression out. So then when that happens or the kids can't go to school, so that's their only respite they have to be able to not have a hand of abuse in their lives because they're at school. That was all taken away from a lot of people. And I think that we're going to see more and more as we continue to come out of the pandemic of people that are really connecting with the these, mm -hmm. you know, Get, with things like gaslighting and, and manipulation and psychological warfare that, um, you know, a lot of us weren't aware of, I, I think, right. it, you know, until you, until it's like right in your face. I mean, I was aware of it because of my father, but not a lot of people are. Yeah. And then they just kind of go, am I going crazy? And then, you know, this woman was saying to, you know, to today over Instagram, like I thought I was going crazy and I was like, well, no, that's gaslighting. Yeah. You know, she was relating to the, um, she's like, you know, it wasn't until I saw your documentary and then I saw, um, dirty John, but the latest one with, uh, the Betty Broderick story where she was just gaslit by the husband who was also ironically a doctor, I believe, or no, he was a lawyer. Was he a lawyer or a doctor? Yeah. He was a lawyer. Um, and you know, it was, it was the, this gaslighting and you know, the, the very essence of the the film of the uh, term comes from a film called Gaslight, which is, uh, you know, it, it's about, uh, you, you know, people start to think they're going crazy because they're yeah. made to feel that way. So it's, it's really nice to be able to shed light on these topics um, as they come forward, I guess. I don't know. I'm probably rambling as I tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was fantastic, Brenda. And um, we are now trying our new Zoom setup, which is super cool. So I yes. hope everyone's enjoyed it. So if you are enjoying this episode, please, please like, subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Please visit my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. Find us on Instagram at Collier Landry at Moving Past Murder. Your help is really appreciated, your support. And it doesn't cost you anything to click, like, subscribe. We really appreciate it. So on that note, I'm Collier Landry. And I'm Brenda Fisher. And this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. The film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today.